Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster, co creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award winning blog, and service organization helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Hi, everyone. Elaine and Diane here. And we know that you want your complex kids to grow up to be happy and independent. And yet you're not always sure how or when to help with that. In this podcast, we'll encourage you to collaborate with all kinds of complex kids and support them in navigating life and learning. And we'll interview leading experts from around the world, as well as parents in our own community, talking about how training for parents actually helps these complex kids. We'll talk about the issues we hear parents struggling with all the time and how a coach approach can support and empower your amazing young people. We won't tell you what to do. We're going to help you figure out how. So let's move on to the next conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another conversation in the Parenting with Impact podcast. My guest today is Danny Donovan. Many of you know her as a visual ADHD creator in the ADHD space. Chances are, if you've seen an infographic somewhere in the last few years about ADHD, you've seen something that Danny's created. So, Danny, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me too. So we were talking a little bit in in advance, y'all, about what she wanted to talk about, because I want to, we always want to give our guests a chance to set the stage of what's important to them. We always start with the question, Danny, how did you get into doing this work, right? Like you don't work specifically with kids, you work specifically in the ADHD education space using creativity and art. So how did that Mm -hmm. come about for you? I will give the, the shortest answer to this. I've got a whole director's cut version. It doesn't have to be the version. shortest, but, but okay. yeah, you know, keep it, you know. Yes. The way that this sort of all came about was actually quite a bit of an accident. I was a graphic designer for 15 years and I had started a new job and overheard one of my coworkers talking about therapy. And I was like, we can just talk about what we're learning about in therapy. Like I've never talked about therapy with any of my friends and here someone's just opening up about it. And then I opened up that I had ADHD and nobody was surprised, but it was the first (laughs) time I felt safe enough in a work environment to do that. And so we ended up coming up with little like inside jokes and I, we came up with an inside joke about how I tell stories. And then I went home and I actually created this, how I tell, or how other people tell stories, how I tell stories, a non ADHD storytelling, which is like start of story, end of story. And then ADHD storytelling, which has the whole like pre-story prologue and, and all this stuff. And it's this big windy chart and it's, I wasn't going to post it. I wasn't going to post it because my boss followed me on Instagram and I didn't, hadn't talked to him about having ADHD. And my friend was like, this is too good. You've got to put it somewhere. And so I put it on Twitter because I thought that nobody would see it. And Aaron Brooke, who's another um, well-known voice in the uh, ADHD online space, retweeted it and it hit like that exact niche audience. And so it, it blew up. There were so many comments and I got the feeling like, oh, wow, the the response to this has been amazing. I want to create more. And so it ended up turning into sort of this like public art therapy project (laughs) where I was expressing myself. First and foremost, I was making these comics for me to help understand my own experiences and to use, I have a, a BFA in visual communication and design. And so getting to use this as an outlet to help process what I was learning about my ADHD was really helpful. And then I moved into TikTok since the pandemic started and I was like all by myself and uh, needed some interaction. And then after all that, I started to realize that the content that was doing the best, not just best for me, um, but what people really responded to were these unorthodox strategies and ADHD friendly tips on how to get stuff done and how to hack your brain into listening to you because it feels like we're constantly arguing with this like side of my brain that doesn't want to do anything that's not fun. And so being able to connect with that and look at how many strategies I had actually been doing myself, just from myself and from ADHD coaching and was able to end up compiling a book called The Anti-Planner, How to Get Stuff Done When You Don't Feel Like It and was able to create this thing. And so now I get to talk about creative productivity and problem solving. And I just, I have such an awesome job. I never could have predicted. (laughs) I feel that I have an awesome job. I never could have predicted. I totally get that. And I remember meeting you like years ago at, I think it was your first ADHD conference. Yeah. And um, it was the International Conference on ADHD. I can't tell you which city because that would require way more working memory than I've got. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Is that what it was? You would know. You were there. But I remember (laughs) 
you were being led around by people and there was a bit of a deer in a headlights quality to your, what the, what is happening here? Right. And so here we are, fast forward a few years later, and you've really gotten your head around. There's this need out there and I'm filling the need. And it, it was so funny because that was, yeah, that was 2019. And I really was like, felt so out of my element. And then in 2021, I was the closing keynote at the chat conference. So right. It's just this space has really grown so big, so fast where people are able to, I think, make such an impact. And even through right, like podcasts like this, being able to connect with people on a mass scale and then be able to get information for free to help make their lives better is just such a fulfilling kind of purpose. It is amazing. So what do you want for people when they see your creative energy? Outlets. What my creative mean? energy or my work? Your work. My work. See, I When your work lands to them to try to mm -hmm. help them with something, what do you want for them? My creations that are what I would say social media content as far as TikToks and comics and stuff like that or Twitter threads. I've had a lot of like t viral tweets that people really connect with and they get shared around on stuff. And ultimately those, I really wanted people to see them as a tool, actually still a tool for sharing experiences with other people when someone else has found the words or someone else has done some of the work to explain this so that when you when they are able to share it with a family member or a parent or a spouse or a, a coworker, a friend, that person who might not understand what it's like in your head can get a better understanding of it. Because often the frame of reference of my stuff is given where it's, this is what it's like, or how I perceive what, what life is like for people who aren't struggling the way I'm struggling. And then this is what it feels like. And so a lot of this internal exploration for people, this catharsis of, oh my God, someone finally gets it. And wow, it's not just me. So my content is really this, wow, it's not just me moment, I think for a lot of people. And then with the book, with the anti-planner, so much of it is maybe there's nothing wrong with me, right? Like where I've abandoned every planner I've ever tried. And it's maybe the problem is I'm trying to get myself to fit into a system that was not designed for me because it requires like daily repetition. Like why aren't there more tools being developed to specifically address the problems that we're actually like facing to, to get to the same results. So I think that the content is a lot more, yeah, the catharsis and the vulnerability understanding and tools to share with people. And then with the book, it's okay, well, what do we actually do? What are some strategies? And so I want to break those two apart if we can, because mm -hmm. I think what I heard you say that was so powerful is this is what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And there's something really important for in our world for parents and professionals to really understand before you get to the tools and the strategies and the techniques and the hacks and all of that stuff. There's sure there's a million ways you can navigate living with ADHD. But if you don't understand the feeling first, then you're going at it backwards. So talk about that. You talk about vulnerability before you get to the tools. What is, what's important about connecting with the feelings? The feelings as aspect of ADHD, especially, but again, anybody who's struggling is this big invisible thing that people don't know about or necessarily talk about that like the feelings of shame and guilt and disappointing other people weighs so heavily on people. And a lot of people have never felt like they've been able to express how frustrating or unfair or how much all of this feels to them because when they do and someone doesn't understand, it's very easy to be like, well, that's not that hard. Or what are you, you know, talking about? And it's a difference in perception and that lived experience where if you aren't around anyone who understands you, it's so easy to just blame yourself because you don't feel like everyone else. And so uncovering how those feelings and those expectations that society has placed on us since we were growing up to be able to decouple that from I'm having a lot of these feelings because I've been told this my whole life. What if this isn't entirely true? What if I am able to question that the things that people have told me about myself that I started to believe about myself? And so I think that being able to tease that apart, give people permission to forgive themselves and that all of the self-exploration that I ended up doing through my content ended up being one of the reasons why the anti-planner is broken up by emotion. It, initially, I was going to break it up, the tools up by you know, strategies, activities, challenges. And then I realized in the moment, what I need is I'm feeling overwhelmed. 
I'm feeling intimidated or I'm feeling perfectionistic. And if I can identify that root cause, that feeling, then you can find, you know, the tool, but the feelings identification part is the first part of all of it. So that's awesome. You just started to go where I wanted to go next. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back and dive into this. Okay. Hi, it's Elaine. And if you like this podcast, you'll love our coach approach. Whether you're a parent looking for support or a professional supporting families, we invite you to download a free guide with 12 key coaching tools at impactparents.com slash gift. You can begin using a coach approach to help kids become more independent or improve all of your conversations at work and at home. That's impactparents.com slash gift. Welcome back, everybody. My guest is Danny Donovan, and we're talking about the emotion and the feelings that we, people with ADHD and probably a lot of other related issues of executive function, tend to internalize about ourselves that actually make it even harder to do what everybody's asking us to do, not because we necessarily can't, but because it's almost we become crippled by the emotions and the stories we tell ourselves, right? So what are some of those, you tell me, is it emotions or is it stories we tell ourselves? Or is it a combination? But there's so much of both. There's actually at the beginning of the anti-planner, there's a um, a page right at the beginning that says RE self-defeating bullcrap, right? And say, Ari, self-defeating, I have say it again. self-defeating bull crap. <laughs> I don't know how much cussing I'm allowed to do on this podcast. So I'm trying to keep it pretty PG, but the, but it, it I have, I'm just quote, I'm just going to lose it. And then I've got my answer to that quote. I don't want to mess up the pages stuff underneath that quote, this nothing ever works. Here's the thing. And so I pretty much got like all those storylines that you're going to tell yourself about why you think this won't work. I'm going to go ahead and address that. And I know the storylines because I live in your head. Like we have so many of the same, I, nothing ever works. I always fail. I'm just going to lose it. And every single time we tell ourselves that story and then there's that so say self-fulfilling prophecy, but genuinely like we still struggle with the same stuff. It happens again. It cements that story further. See, I was right. See, I always do quit stuff. And so the whole reason why I developed this tool the way I did was to be used in the moments where the emotions are running high and those emotions are getting in the way of productivity because, and then otherwise you don't have to use it. You could forget about this for three years and that, that release yourself from the idea that you have to use a productivity tool every day or every week in order for it to be helpful. And I think that is helping with the storylines that people feel surrounding productivity a lot. I love that. And you can see that I'm distracted by something you said that I don't want to lose because it's so important, right? What you're saying is we cement these stories for their, for ourselves. So when we mm-hmm. tell ourselves the story, I'm not good enough, I'm going to mess it up, it never works. That cements, but this just in for me, here's my aha. We parents do this unintentionally. Mm-hmm. We do the same thing. We parents say, sure, you want to do it? Fine, you do it. And when they aren't ready to do it independently, which they're often not, we've thrown our hands up. And so then we can justify it and say, see, I told you, you couldn't do it. Now mm-hmm. you need me to direct you through it. And so in our language, we talk about going from phase one or back to phase one. And then, but what you're, what you just said was really important because there's a way in which we parents are unintentionally locking in those negative messages for our kids when it's the last thing we really want to do. Right. The reinforcement. (laughs) Yeah. So you're a stepmom. What comes up for you when you hear that? Like, how do we deal with that? It can be so challenging, I think, to be able to recognize it in the moment when emotions are running high, Mm -hmm. right? When I have, yeah, exactly. When I'm, especially if you're a parent who has ADHD, but even if you're not, I will not, I was a frustrating, a frustrating kid, even as an adult, I'm like, I frustrate myself, right? If you're frustrated with me, try living, I live in here 24, seven, three, six, five, right? And being managed, yes, in order to manage that frustration and to be able to like, take a deep breath and like emotionally regulate and reset yourself when you yourself are feeling like I say triggered, but feeling like a, one of those reinforced storylines that's happening. And every time it happens, it feels like that you always do this. You never do this. And those are the exact types of phrases that people find really challenging, but those really do, especially at a young age, I think start to get in the back of your head. And then when you're in therapy while you're older, now I have to like 
detangle. No parents, I would say no parent is perfect. So we're all doing the best that we can with what we've got to give at the time. But ultimately, I think that when we see our kids to falling into the same like thinking patterns that we have ourselves that we may not see with Colin, right? He's uh, 10 and will be coloring stuff or will be drawing stuff. And something isn't perfect. Something isn't perfect. And I wanted, and, and nope, I got to start over. Something isn't perfect. Oh no, I got to start over. And oh, now I'm so like tired and I've worked so hard. I have nothing to show for it. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm yeah. like, oh, I relate so much. So it's heartbreaking there. to watch, to see someone else going through it. And I'm like, that's only okay when I do it. And it's still not okay when I do it, but it, I think does, does raise so much about the pressure that we put on ourselves and our scare, our fear of failure especially if we've been criticized much more than our neurotypical peers, that criticism hits even harder. And the other thing is that what you just said is it's heartbreaking to watch and it's so painful to watch. And so we want, we think that we're circumventing that pain by doing it for, by fixing, by we think Mm -hmm. we're making it better and we're actually not. If we're not stepping into the compassion for what it feels like for them, Right? Mm-hmm. And that's what I think I'm getting is you're getting into the mind of the person with the complex issue rather than the yes. person experiencing the person with the complex. Yes. Issue. And that is what I think people love about my content is that it allows people to, to step into the shoes of someone with ADHD and see a, a better idea of like their perception of, and their experience of how the world feels. So I've got some where it's laundry And there are four, there's people like running the non-ADHD one. There's a few hurdles that say wash, dry, fold, put away. And they're all the same height and the person's like jumping over them. And then the ADHD one says wash, it has the same steps, but each hurdle gets taller and put away is like off the screen, right? Right. Because each of those things compounds on itself and makes it, it's harder to get to those steps. Is that actually, if actually accurate, are those things actually take more work, I would say work than the other person and effort. And it feels like the answer is no, but it does take more work and effort because you are fighting upstream. You're swimming upstream and someone else is swimming in a slightly less than calm pool. And it's, this isn't that hard. I'm like, you don't know what it's like though, because you're not living my experience. And so one of the biggest things that I try to remember as a step parent and when interacting with anybody, right? When someone's younger is having, and a kid's having a really big emotional reaction to something, trying to not like logic it and I'm 33 and to use my like 33 year old brain and think and have this emotion of, well, that's not, that's not a big deal where it's like when, if I was 10 and I was going through this, this would be the biggest deal. deal. This is the biggest deal. I've only lived. I haven't been along that long. This is one of the biggest deals of what's happened to me so far in my life and applying and coming back down and remembering how would I be feeling if I was this age? And trying to remember that's the set of emotional skills that kids working with, and they need a little compassion on your head. Yeah, uh, maybe a lot of compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So don't logic it. Recognize that it's about tapping into the emotion, right? Mm -hmm. And once you tap into the emotion, emotion of it, then, so what we talked about was we would then come back and talk about some of the productivity because you've actually gotten into helping people figure out how to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. So a big part, spoiler alert, everybody is spend some time with the emotion (laughs) that we're really dealing with, that that the emotion is key to getting something done. So that Mm -hmm. I think that's, if we have no other message, that's the key. Yes. And I, I think that one of the things that people like the most about the book and it being divided up by feeling is that each of those feelings, like you identify the big feeling, right? So I've got stuck, overwhelmed, unmotivated, disorganized, and discouraged versus giving you a straight up list of 18 things, read all of these things. It's okay. Now I only have to decide between five and you flip to the tab in that section, right? And it's, let's say it's the overwhelmed tab and there's intimidated, overcommitted, panicked, and burnt out. And each of those sections has little bullets, little I statements that say, I feel or there's so much I need. There's so much I need to do. I don't even know where to start. I don't even, and you read the bullets and you go, is this how I'm feeling? Does this sound like what's playing through my head right now? And people can read that stuff, identify, oop, yep, that's it. And now they have started to get into the feeling of learning to identify that emotion and what thought process and what feelings are coming up. Because if you just tell people, here are the names of the emotions, figure out what you're feeling. Yeah, that's a lot of people struggle with that if they haven't been through a decade of therapy. (laughs) 
Well, so, so you, I know that you've done in your own work, you've had some experience of your life doing therapy and what you've referenced is that being in ADHD coaching has really changed things for you. Oh, absolutely. So was, after my that? mom, dad, and spouse, my ADHD coach is the next like person in my thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the impact of that for you? What's important about it for you? So much of what I took away from coaching and the absolutely like underlined theme of the anti-planner, which is if a tool isn't working, it's for you. It's not the right tool. Yeah. It doesn't say anything about you as a person. It doesn't say anything about what it says is if this isn't working for me, it's not working for me. And now I have information. It is simply, do I want to adjust something and keep doing it? Do I want to table this and try it again later? Or do I want to abandon this because I actually hate it? And I don't think anything I do is going to make this easier. And when you can view all of this stuff as an experiment, when you can view strategies or trying not as a, oh, I did this for two months and then I quit because I always quit anything. If it's a, wow, this worked for me for two months, maybe I'll come back and use this again sometime when it's new again. And it's understanding me, that- I'm a this, novelty fiend. So it's yes. only going to work for a couple of months before I get bored with it and need another one. Anyway. Yes. But then yeah. sometimes down the line, so Kanban boards, which are, you know, you move post-its and stuff from to do to in progress to on hold or done. And I will do that for like big major projects. And then I'll keep doing it a little bit and then I'll fall off. Every time I've got a big, new, complicated, major project, I bust out this one strategy. And I used to feel this guilt for, I like it. I like doing it. Why don't I do it all the time? And it's because I don't need it all the time. You need it. I yeah. pull it out when I need it. <laughs> I'm the same way with a mind map. When I'm totally mm. overwhelmed, I go to the mind map and I get I dump everything onto mind maps. I may not look at it again. And then I'll look at it again, six months and say, Ooh, check, 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 you know, like I just needed to dump it, right? So we have to yes. find what works for us and not allow the judgment, the tyranny of the strategy to be, to dominate what we figure out works for us. And my big thing and takeaway from so much of this is that a lot of the advice that we're given was not designed with us in mind. And so therefore, when it doesn't work, and it's like, everybody says, I'm supposed to do this, 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 and this. And I tried it. And after a week and a half, I got bored and I gave up. And there is very little, and prior to, again, this big giant burst of deep content now, there were limited options for where to get your strategies from people whose brains work like yours. And yep. so now what we're seeing is all of these like novel, just so weird it works strategies that are fun and novel and engaging and like bite-sized and perfect for our brains. And because when you are able to get a lot of them at one time, so you have options. So if one isn't working, you can toss it and get it and get another one. Being able to feel like the possibilities there or the invention, right? Like with the anti-planner, I've actually got a whole spread on how to invent your own strategies because taking your own personal interest, and I've got a list of like interests and of gamification strategies, and how can I take some of the stuff I'm interested in and pair it with, with one of these strategies? I want a, a really fast example. I, we were talking before we started recording about um, studying. And Colin came home with his first study guide ever. And I was like, oh my God. And we ran through it. It's just, it's memorization. It's the first, do you remember this date? Do you remember what this was called? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? And we went through the whole thing and he had, it was like a 23%. And I was like, oh no, I'm about to, to homeschool, right? And I, yeah. instead of just making regular flashcards, I said, okay, he's really into art. Like him and I are both into drawing. And I got some blank flashcards and I said, I'm going to read you a thing and you're going to write out what it is and then flip over the flashcard and on the back, I'm going to read you what it is and I want you to draw it for me. Draw me a comic, right? And so he would draw it out and we do it and we did it for the whole stack of flashcards. And then I made another, a second set of flashcards that just has the names on it. And I said, okay, match them. Match what thing goes with which picture. And then when we got that, then we started going through and I said, here's the picture what's the thing? And then he'd tell me what the thing was. And then we flipped it eventually to where here's the name of the thing. What is it? And so by going through that and, and completely changing up, he likes drawing. How can I make him study when he doesn't feel like it? Asking him questions back and forth isn't going to work. Then you're able to get something. He got a 98 on his test. So. Beautiful. Well, and, and so I, want to, I want to deconstruct what you just said. Okay. With, with your permission. First of all, he likes to draw. So you tapped into a strength in an area of interest. So you didn't, if you have a kid who doesn't like to draw, that strategy is not a good one. It's not mm -hmm. going to work. So perfect example of it's got to meet the needs and the capacity of the person you're playing with. You had his buy-in, you were gaming and playing with him. You were engaging with him so that 
he wasn't felt feeling scolded or talked at or anything else. He was part of a process. And you were actually teaching him a process of learning for himself that he could replicate in the future for himself. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really beautiful stuff in that. And this is not to say that strategy is going to work for every kid. Yeah. Danny did when she figured out what strategy, how does this kid's brain work? And how do we play to that and suggest things? And my hunch is that there was some place in that process where he pushed back and he's no do this way instead of that way. Is that fair? Is that accurate? Was there any place where he went, well, what about this instead of that? A a little pushback. So we had some where I was trying to initially, some of the spelling was off, right? And I like he, it was John Adams and he put A-T-O-M, right? John Adams, A-T-O-M-S, John Adams. And I was like, that's actually not how you spell it. And then he's like, well, I had some stuff. And I said, you know, what if in this comic we drew little, how would you draw Adams? And he like drew little, which has nothing to do with John Adams. But at right. the end of the day, the rest of the picture was there and the atoms were there. And so when we were doing the matching, I saw the atoms or when he started to think about it, he saw the atoms and it was this thing that's unrelated, but is a homophone that I, I initially had, the, I had. I had the initial reaction of, I want to change it. I want to fix it so that you know how to spell it right. And at the end of the day, by the last step, I, it was spelled right. And he was able that's to right. still identify it. Beautiful. Great example. All right. I hate to do this, but we have to start wrapping up this conversation. Tell people how they can find out more about you and your book and what you're about. So my ADHD comics website is ADHDDD.com and then antiplanner.com. They should be in the show notes. I've got my comics and TikTok embedded TikToks. So if you don't have a TikTok account, you can still watch them. And then information about the anti-planner. And then you can follow me on all the social medias. It's at Danny Donovan. I think they can have this stuff in the show notes also. Yeah, we'll have all that there. All <laughs> that there. Everything. All the things. All the things. Okay. This was amazing. And I wish we had more time. As we wrap up this conversation, Danny, what have we not talked about that you want to make sure you mention, or what have we talked about that you want to highlight? But how do you want to help summarize this? Yeah, help people. I really think that the, you had mentioned uh, at some point that like doing some sort of a meaningful quote, right? And I think that the one of the ones at the beginning, which is close to like Brene Brown, but like your worth is not measured in productivity. And so I think that remembering, right, especially when you've got kids and it's stuff related to ADHD or especially when it's a job and this is my livelihood on the line, productivity feels like the most important thing to everybody all of the time. And it's really hard because we don't always step back and be like, I have the sweetest kid. I have the like, you kindest, know, I've got yeah. the, the kindest kid I've got. I was having a really, really, really bad day. And Colin was like, do you want to watch Encanto? Which is like my favorite movie. And it's those little moments. And it's easy to forget that or forget those moments when you're, fr- when you're really big emotions and, and being really frustrated or things aren't working. And to remember that like getting them involved in what, okay, this isn't working. What might we try? It's the same thing with coaching, right? If someone tells you what to do, it's not going to stick as well as if you ask some questions to figure out what they might want to try, you're going to get that buy-in of I helped make this idea. So yes, I'm going to try it versus somebody giving a directive. So I really think that the experimentation and making it a collaborative thing of, okay, we are not, we're having a hard time doing the cleaning your room how might we turn this into a game and have them help you? So the onus is not on you to come up with everything. Beautiful. So ask questions to get by and make it collaborative. What she's saying, y'all, is take a coach approach, (laughs) which I love. And so I was going to ask you your favorite quote or motto. And what I heard you saying was your work is not measured in productivity. Your worth, like your worth worth as a person. And I really think that we can get so caught up in all of our like fit quote unquote failures and all of the things that we're not doing that we don't give ourselves credit for how hard we're trying. That is so true. So, wow, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing, for bringing joy and humor and lightness to to this world of navigating ADHD. I think one of the things that I have always really been about at Impact is that, yeah, we're dealing with heavy stuff, but we need to hold it lightly, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to find the humor and the joy that's the access point to, to really manage ourselves most effectively. And I think you have modeled that and you do that so beautifully. So thank you for what you're doing. 
And thank, thank you. you. Don't make me cry. <laughs> Beautiful. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, I wouldn't be able to do any of this without the amazing community out there. So thank you so much for giving back um, and providing tools and strategies for people who need help too. Thanks. And to those of you listening, thanks for what you're doing for yourself and for your kids. Take a moment to, to capture for yourself. What are your insights from this conversation? What are you taking away from what Danny and I talked about? We know what we talked about. But what are you taking away and how do you want to apply that in your life in the coming week? What do you want to use? What do you want to, what's the insight that's landing with you? And again, we honor what you do for yourself and for your kids, whether you have your own complex issues as an adult or whether you're a neurotypical trying to navigate those of us with complex issues. At the end of the day, what you do, your engagement, you're being here, you're listening, you're tuning in, you're doing this work. It makes a difference. Take care, everyone. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Behavior therapy training for parents is actually recommended as a first-line treatment for complex kids. For information about Sanity School, our training program for parents or teachers, which has helped thousands of families around the globe, visit impactparents.com slash sanity school.